हेलो मेडिकोस गुड डे टू ऑल ऑफ यू सो इन टूडे लेक्चर वी आर एक्चुअली गोइंग टू डिस्कस एंड अंडरस्टैंड दी स्पाइनल कॉर्ड सो विद रिस्पेक्ट टू द स्पाइनल कॉर्ड अवर लर्निंग ऑब्जेक्टिव फॉर टूडे विल बी ए शॉर्ट इंट्रोडक्शन अबाउट दी स्पाइनल कॉर्ड so what is the main function of the spinal cord then followed by that we will actually understand the situation and extent of the spinal cord to so how far it extends and where actually it is situated followed by that uh, we will actually understand the various external features of the spinal cord okay and then the uh, blood supply of the spinal cord then followed by that coverings the various uh, coverings the three meninges of the spinal cord and then we will actually discuss about the internal structure of the spinal cord and within the internal structure we will also see the arrangement of the uh, gray matter of the spinal cord which is in the form of a nucleus and a very brief account of the tracks of the spinal cord and uh, finally we will conclude today's session with the clinical aspects okay now first of all with respect to the spinal cord so here you are able to see the spinal cord it is actually a long cylindrical cord like structure which is a part of your central nervous system so your nervous system consists of the brain and then the spinal cord so as i told you developmentally uh, both are from the neural tube so the neural tube upper end show some expansions which forms the various parts of your brain okay so primitive expansions are brain vesicles they are the prosencephalon and then you have the mesencephalon and the rhombencephalon the remaining part of the tube so remains as such in the tubular form itself and that is called as the spinal cord now what is the main function of this uh, spinal cord <coughs> so to put it in simple terms this can be called as the information highway so all the information to the brain travels via the spinal cord and all the information from the brain to our body uh, whether it is to the surface of the body okay peripheral part of the body or to the inner aspect to the various organs organ systems of the body is actually transmitted uh, from the brain to the as i told you various parts of the body via the spinal cord okay so that is the main function so it mainly receives the information whatever the stimuli whether it is exteroceptive stimuli which is arising from externally like your pain uh, temperature or uh, touch pressure okay interoceptive sensations uh, which is arising within your body from the organs so again organ you have a visceral pain then sense of distension sense of feeling or any un what do you call uncomfortable feeling all those things interoceptive sensations and of course uh, one more part is the proprioception which is arising from the muscles okay position of the muscles degree of contraction of the muscle so all these sensations are received via these uh, nerves the peripheral nerves so that in the last class itself we have seen there are 31 pairs of peripheral nerves and 12 pairs of the cranial nerves okay so while the cranial nerves directly end in the brain these peripheral nerves pass all this information via the spinal cord now this information is actually transmitted to the brain it is processed there and then appropriate action is whatever the appropriate action should be taken is again transmitted via the spinal cord uh, 
and to these peripheral nerves for the appropriate action. So one appropriate action, as you know, mainly is the muscle action. So contraction of the muscle or the joint, moving the joint. That is one major action, which is the motor action. Okay, and uh, other actions, it is uh, mediated through the uh, parasympathetic, which is also a part of the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so which brings about uh, so many changes based on the environment, internal or the external environment, like vasoconstriction or vasodilatation or increase or decrease in your heart rate, respiratory rate, gut motility and so on. Okay, now, so every information has to be transmitted to the brain or uh, all the information has to come from the brain or the higher center. This is not always uh, happening, but sometimes at the level of spinal cord itself, what happens is the information is processed. Okay, and then appropriate action is taken place. And that type of uh, action only we call it as the reflex. So some coordination for immediate response because this is mainly response, mainly necessary for the immediate response through a simple reflex. So where an afferent neuron and then what happens is an efferent neuron directly have the communication. So through that what happens is the sensations received by the afferent neuron is immediately transmitted to the efferent neuron and uh, from the different neuron different axons the motor stimuli passes and immediate action takes place. So for example you, you have that reflexes the patellar reflex your cremastric reflex achilles tendon reflex so deep tendon reflexes they are called as and sometimes superficial uh, reflex which is called as the cremasteric reflex okay so abdominal reflexes is called as the superficial reflex cremastric reflex is a superficial reflex whereas these are actually deep tendon reflexes okay so some amount of this coordination takes place not necessarily it should uh, take place only within a particular segment of the spinal cord two or three segments that means more than one segment also is involved to bring out these necessary actions okay so with this uh, short introduction we will actually pass on to the uh, gross features of the spinal cord so where actually the spinal cord is situated so it is situated deep within your vertebral column so clinically the vertebral column itself is referred as the spine so when they tell spine means they are referring to the vertebral column okay so body of the vertebra and behind you have the pedicle and the lamina of the vertebra so between them you have a opening or canal which is called as the neural canal or the vertebral column so within the full length of the vertebral column the vertebral canal or the neural canal extends and the spinal cord is actually situated and occupies the upper two-third so that means only up till the uh, lumbar vertebra that is also only up till the first lumbar vertebra up to the lower border of the first lumbar vertebra the spinal cord is uh, extending that is the case of the adults okay so first cervical to the first lumbar vertebra okay so beyond that you can see only the uh, nerve roots are actually extending so naturally you should uh, have a uh, doubt about uh, you sir you are telling that only up to the first lumbar vertebra but when we study about the spinal segments you are able to see up to c1 coccygeal nerve okay so that i will uh, discuss it uh, in the coming slides okay how this happens then the length is approximately 45 centimeters it is not an exact uh, um, number approximately 45 centimeters and it is believed that in women it is uh, two to three centimeters shorter and that mainly depends upon your height okay the length of the spinal cord depends upon your height okay so at the time of birth you are able to see 
the spinal cord extends up to the L3 vertebra. Okay, so it is a bit longer and in fetal life, intrauterine, it extends up to the whole length during the development, whole length of the vertebral canal. So how this is possible? Whether actually the, after that the spinal cord uh, contracts or shrinks or becomes shorter, that is not the case. It is mainly due to the differential growth. So the rate of growth of the vertebral canal or the vertebra is more as compared to the spinal cord. So naturally what happens is this vertebral canal uh, when it, it increases in size whereas the spinal cord remains after a certain period of time. Okay, So that is the main reason why actually in adult it is at the level of the lower border of the L1 vertebra. Okay, Whereas in children it is extending up to the L3 vertebra in the newborn especially. Okay, So that is about the situation and extent of the spinal cord. Now coming to the external future, so this is the actual specimen of the spinal cord uh, with the meninges especially the dura matter is uh, cut and uh, reflected. So in the midline you will be able to see a deep fissure which is called as the anterior median fissure. So here you are able to see so that fissure is actually called as the anterior median fissure in the anterior midline. Same way posteriorly also in the midline you are able to see a, uh, not actually a fissure but more uh, shallow not as deep as this fissure and uh, that is called as the posterior median sulcus or septum. Okay? So sulcus is somewhat uh, not very deep whereas the fissure is actually very deep. So anterior median fissure and posterior median sulcus which you will be able to see in the anterior and posterior midline. Then you also have some uh, sulcus. So sulcus means which is shallow also laterally to this anterior median fissure. Okay, They are called as the anterolateral sulcus. Okay, And then posteriorly also you see a shallow uh, indentation which is called as the posterolateral sulcus. So anterolateral sulcus and then what you see is the posterolateral sulcus. So along the length of this anterolateral sulcus and the posterolateral sulcus, the nerve roots arise. So these are the ventral nerve roots and other one, this is the dorsal nerve roots. So you know the ventral and dorsal nerve roots, they unite to form a typical spinal nerve. Okay, And this enlargement, what you are able to see is the dorsal root ganglion which is a uh, entity or part of your dorsal nerve root okay dorsal root ganglion okay so both the nerve roots the ventral nerve roots and the dorsal nerve roots they arise uh, from this uh, anterolateral and posterolateral sulcus and they unite to form the typical spinal nerve so the nerve emerges from the intervertebral foramen okay now the lower end of the spinal cord at the L1, it tapers like a cone. Okay, it is conical, pointed conical structure, and that is called as the conus medullaris. Okay, so that is the terminal part of the spinal cord. Okay. Then coming to the other external features, it shows two bulgings or enlargements. Okay, one is actually called as the cervical enlargement and other one is actually called as the lumbar enlargement. So here the spinal cord is somewhat very thick and bulged, um, especially it extends from the C3 to T1 or T2. Okay, So it is called as the cervical enlargement. So from here only your uh, cervical and brachial plexus arise. Okay? So the cervical and brachial plexus mainly the brachial plexus especially is going to innervate your upper limb. So apart from our trunk of the body, since the limbs are considered as the enlargements, appendages, outward growth, naturally you need more amount of nervous tissue to supply this. So you see that enlargements, especially in the cervical region and then in the lumbar region from L1 to L3. So there also the plexus are given, the lumbar and the sacral plexus. 
so mainly the lumbar plexus innervate your lower limb then apart from that on either side you can see the 31 pairs of spinal nerves which emerge from either side of the spinal cord so they are by the union of the anterior root and the posterior root and then forms a spinal nerve single spinal nerve which emerges through the intervertebral foramen okay now beyond the conus medullaris you can see there are only these nerves which are emerging spinal nerves they are resemble the tail of a horse and that is why it is called as the cauda equina okay the upper nerves you are able to see they travel horizontally or transversely as you come lower they become somewhat oblique and uh, almost the lowermost segments nerves from the lowermost segments especially the lower lumbar and the sacral nerves they travel vertically downwards and resemble the tail of a horse and that is called as the cauda equina so so we have discussed about some of the external features now continuing with the external features what is a spinal segment so the part of the spinal cord so this segment of the spinal cord which gives rise to a single spinal nerve is called as the spinal segment okay so that is formed by the union of this dorsal root which uh, possesses a ganglia dorsal root ganglia and the ventral root both these roots unite to form the typical spinal nerve and which emerges from the intervertebral foramen so at the sides of the vertebra you are able to see this gap between them is actually called as the intervertebral foramen this is your vertebral notch okay so through the intervertebral foramen the 31 pairs of the spinal nerves they emerge okay and uh, you know that the dorsal root carries all your sensations afferent they are actually called as afferent nerve fibers because they run towards the spinal cord so all the stimuli exteroceptive interoceptive proprioception is carried through this and ventral nerve roots they carry the motor uh, nerve roots okay they are efferent uh, uh, nerve roots mainly what happens is they carry the motor information which is going to supply to your muscles and uh, to your glands or blood vessels okay so efferent nerve roots are actually motor so a typical spinal nerve is actually a combination of both afferent and efferent so that means it is mixed it contains both the sensory as well as the motor fibers okay so now coming to the segments lie above the numerical corresponding vertebra which means this holds good for the cervical part now first cervical nerve c1 nerve or the c1 segment is actually present above the c1 vertebra okay so that means it is first nerve is between the skull base of the skull and the first cervical vertebra c1 and base of skull the c1 arises now for example if we consider this as c1 and this is c2 so what emerges here is the c2 vertebra so that means c2 nerve spinal nerve so that means c2 nerve is actually originating above the c2 vertebra so that is why above the numerically corresponding vertebra are you able to understand okay now what happens is gradually as these spinal nerves and the spinal segments as you go down it uh, differs now when you come to the thoracic before that i just want to tell you so that is why in case of the cervical region you have seven cervical vertebra but eight cervical nerves so that is why the c1 nerve is also referred to as the sub occipital nerve okay now as you come to the thoracic regions slowly you have to add one to the cervical segments naturally the corresponding it comes so for example between t1 and t2 what happens is only the first will come so below that t1 okay then as you proceed lower down you should add two uh, uh, what two number to the corresponding segments okay so 
like that so that is why what happens is if you trace the last l1 border at the lower border of l1 vertebra that segment will actually be a coccygeal spinal segment okay so now you would have understood how the spinal cord ends at the l1 vertebra but below that you have the lumbar and the sacral segments coming out l2 or l3 l4 l5 so you have to add one number to the thoracic two number to the lobe to the lumbar and as you proceed down you should also add three number to the corresponding vertebra to identify the spinal segment okay so they emerge from the intervertebral foramen the spinal nerves so here you are able to see a simple spinal reflex now for example what happens is this is the patellar tendon reflex so with the knee hammer if you just uh, uh what do you call tap the patellar tendon or ligamentum patellae or quadriceps tendon so this information is actually traveling because it is a tendon it goes via this uh, muscle spindle the afferent neurons they pass via the dorsal root the dorsal root ganglion really in the posterior horn and this has a direct connection with the Uh, anterior horn cells neurons present in the anterior horn and the motor information is actually passing to the muscle and naturally what happens is your knee is extended so now it is extended so this is a very simple mono synaptic reflex and that is your muscle spindle which consists of your nuclear chain fibers and nuclear back fibers and they are actually innervated by the gamma motor neurons okay so we will come to it uh, after some time alpha motor neurons and the gamma motor neurons so this is a simple reflex okay a polysynaptic reflex when an interneuron is present uh, between this uh, afferent and efferent neurons then it is actually called as a polysynaptic reflex okay so they are present because of the presence of the interneurons so mainly this stretch reflex or myostatic reflex okay uh, the deep tendon reflex which you are able to see like that you also have achilles tendon reflex okay so achilles tendon reflex biceps tendon reflex there are also other reflexes like superficial reflex one is the plantar reflex so you stroke the you skin of the sole of the foot then naturally what happens is there should be flexion of the toes okay which is a normal plantar reflex if the toe is instead of plantar flexion it is dorsiflexed and all the remaining toes first to toe is uh, is dorsiflexed and all the other toes fans out it is called as a positive babinski sign okay it is called as a positive babinski sign so there is some lesion in the spinal cord especially in the motor uh, tracts okay so this babinski sign will be positive in children because the myelination is not complete then you have cremastric reflex when you actually stroke the skin of the scrotum you can see the scrotum moves upwards inner side of the thigh if you stroke this to test the l2 segment okay the so presence or testing of this abdominal reflexes is mainly to analyze whether that part of the spinal cord is intact to actually identify the level of lesion same way abdominal reflexes the skin of the abdomen actually if you strike it then naturally you can see the contraction of the anterior abdominal wall so abdominal reflex cremastric reflex uh, and plantar reflexes are actually superficial reflexes same way the other type of reflex uh, the stretch reflex what you see is the deep tendon reflex so oh. now we have finished about the external features of the spinal cord now we are moving on to the meninges of the spinal cord so coming to the meninges of the spinal cord so as of the brain the spinal cord is also covered by three meninges three layers of coverings you see they are the outer tough dura mater then you have the middle pia middle arachnoid mater and then the deep pia mater okay so the dura mater arachnoid mater and then the pia mater 
so the arrangement is almost the same so deep to the dura matter you have the subdural space deep to the arachnoid matter you have the sub arachnoid space which is filled with the cerebrospinal fluid now the spinal dura is not fused to the endosteum you are able to understand so like you have the meningeal layer and the endosteal layer so here you do not have that uh, uh, endosteal layer which is fusing to it only a single layer the spinal layer of the dura mater is present and uh, between the vertebral canal and the dura mater there is a space which is called as the epidural space so that brown color one is the dura mater so between the dura mater and the bone endosteum of the vertebral canal you have a space which is called as the epidural space so it is filled with the fat and you also have the internal vertebral venous plexus internal vertebral venous plexus in this epidural space so this epidural space is of uh, clinical importance i will come to it uh, in the clinical aspects of it while discussing about this clinical importance of the epidural space now the dura mater below the l1 because spinal cords end below the l1 beyond that what happens is it uh, actually covers the phylum terminal okay not only that this dura mater you are able to see it is covering even the nerve roots the dorsal and the ventral nerve roots and uh, this dura mater is attached to the margins of the intervertebral foramen which we saw in the last slide okay through which the spinal nerve emerges there actually it is covered beyond that uh, the spinal nerve is only covered by the uh, squamous cells myelinated okay the myelination so laterally it is attached uh, along the margins of the intervertebral foramen same way if you trace the dura mater above it will be attached to the margins of the foramen magnum okay so thereby the epidural space which we saw just now does not extend into the cranial cavity below if you trace it the dura mater actually attaches uh, almost to the second sacral vertebra okay and uh, but the dura mater also extends up to the coccyx okay so which uh, encloses not the spinal cord but uh, a structure called as the phylum terminal so beyond the uh, what do you call the conus medullaris at the lower border of l1 the dura mater covers these uh, uh, nerve filaments cauda equina and then the phylum terminal okay so above as i told you it fuses to the margins of the foramen magnum so the epidural space does not extend into the cranial cavity okay coming to the next uh, layer which is called as the arachnoid mater so it is present deep to the dura mater so here you are able to see that is the uh, arachnoid mater okay so cut and reflected for you so arachnoid mater again extends only up to the second sacral vertebra it extends only up till the second sacral vertebra and deep to the arachnoid mater what you have is the sub arachnoid space and uh, outside the arachnoid mater between the dura and the arachnoid is the subdural space okay now if you look uh, the spinal cord ends at the level of lower border of l1 the conus medullaris so beyond that you are able to see there is an extension of the spinal uh, extension of the dura mater arachnoid mater and the pia mater okay so the dura mater extends only up till the second cervical vertebra okay and uh, deep to the dura mater uh, arachnoid mater what you have is the cerebro spinal fluid so here you are able to see there is a free flow of cerebro spinal fluid and uh, inside the cerebro spinal fluid subarachnoid space you see the phylum terminal and of course the cauda equina the nerve filaments are bathed in this free uh, csf subarachnoid space which consists of free flow of csf and that is called as the spinal cistern okay or 
sometimes referred to as the terminal ventricle so below the l1 to up to s2 you have only the coverings extending okay and uh, that is your arachnoid up to s2 it extends beyond that up to the tip of coccyx uh, you can see the only the pia mater extending as the phylum terminal okay and also the dura okay so the lower spinal rootlets and the phylum terminal is actually bathed in this free flow of csf so next uh, coming to the next meninges which is called as the pia mater so this is the innermost uh, layer uh, while the other two are actually loosely enveloping the spinal cord this pia mater is closely applied and it is a vascular membrane because most of the blood vessels they ramify over this pia mater now this pia mater shows some modifications especially in the anterior median fissure you can see a glistening band which is thickening and called as the linea splendens okay so along the anterior median fissure you can see a glistening band which is called as the linea splendens okay now apart from that one more modification you are able to see this uh, tooth like extensions of the pia mater which is present between the nerve roots anterior and posterior nerve roots you are able to see anterior and posterior nerve roots so between that uh, between the nerve roots you can see um, an extension of the pia mater which pierces the arachnoid and attaches to the dura mater that is called as the ligamentum denticulatum so they are tooth like process so only name ligamentum denticulatum uh, 21 to 22 pairs you can see along the length of the spinal cord on either side so they to some extent what happens is helps to keep the cord suspended in the vertebral canal so that the cord does not go and touch or beat the walls of the vertebral canal so any injury mechanical injury is prevented by this uh, ligamentum denticulatum or tooth like processes okay the pia mater as i told you which is within the dura and the arachnoid mater up to the s2 vertebra so from conus medullaris you can see an extension of the pia mater within the dura and the arachnoid is called as the phylum terminal internum then beyond that you are able to see it is only the pia mater which is not covered by the dura mater and from the second sacral vertebra to the tip of coccyx it extends which is called as the phylum terminal externum okay so phylum terminal is the pia and internum of which it is divided into phylum terminal internum within the dura extending from the conus medullaris lower border of l1 to second sacral vertebra so beyond that uh, it is not covered by the arachnoid matter and extending from s2 to the tip of dorsal surface of the coccyx is actually called as the phylum terminal externum okay so coming to the clinical aspects first what we are going to see is the epidural block or anesthesia so the nerve roots are anesthetized when an anesthetic agent is injected into the epidural space which is between the dura and the vertebral canal so the nerve roots are actually what happens which are emerging piercing the dura and coming which in this uh, space epidural space if you give the anesthetic agent all these nerve roots are anesthetized and mostly it is performed in the obstetric practice during childbirth are you able to understand so in the obstetric practice to in the childbirth to actually relieve pain it is done mainly in the lower lumbar and sacral regions then you also more cordially if you go it is called as the caudal epidural anesthesia so this is caudal epidural anesthesia which is given through the sacral hiatus instead of uh, give approach to the lower lumbar so the lower lumbar and sacral nerves only the sacral nerves alone especially the s4 and s5 through the sacral hiatus it is given this is mainly for to perform procedures in the perineum in the perineal region any procedures for example uh, surgical uh, treatment uh, 
in the perineal region mainly for your hemorrhoids so any uh, procedures with respect to the hemorrhoids or uh, actually repairing a perineal tear okay so for all these regions you give a preferred method is the caudal epidural anesthesia only the lower sacral nerve roots are actually anesthetized then what is lumbar puncture so lumbar puncture is actually a procedure which is performed at the level of l3 l4 level because spinal cord ends at the level of uh, l1 lower border of l1 so l3 l4 is actually a very safe area to perform the lumbar puncture here what happens is the needle is introduced from externally starting from skin supraspinous ligament spatia supraspinous ligament and from there uh, to the subarachnoid space to withdraw the csf so for any diagnostic procedures or okay so or also sometimes uh, anesthesia is introduced even into the uh, space subarachnoid space that is called as lumbar puncture one more uh, actually lumbar puncture procedure is diagnostic procedure to detect block in the ventricle so that is done through a test called as the quickensteads test so once a lumbar puncture is done you insert or attach a barometer and then you compress the external jugular vein so when you compress the external jugular vein what happens is the through intra cranial pressure should rise and naturally what happens is the reading or the level in the barometer also should elevate so the pressure you have applied in the neck should reflect here if these there is no reflection of this pressure in the barometer attached that means there is some block in between especially in the ventricles the csf is not drained properly there is some block in the ventricular system or in the drainage of the ventricular system so a test to find that is actually called as the quickensteads test okay so now coming to the blood supply of the spinal cord so with respect to the blood supply of the spinal cord the spinal cord is mainly supplied by one anterior spinal artery and two posterior spinal arteries so the anterior and posterior spinal artery are branches of the vertebral arteries so the vertebral arteries both the vertebral arteries of either side passes the, through the foramen magnum and unites to form the basilar artery so prior to its union it gives one anterior spinal artery which you can see in the anterior median fissure and two posterior spinal arteries on either side of the posterior median sulcus okay so then what happens is apart from the anterior and posterior spinal arteries because the anterior and posterior spinal arteries are sufficient enough only to supply up to the cervical segments of the spinal cord below that the whole length of the spinal cord the blood supply is mainly by the radicular branches so they reinforce this anterior and posterior spinal arteries they are called as segmental arteries because they are derived from the respective segments okay so as you are able to see the respective segments radicular branches they are called as radicular branches from the vertebral ascending cervical deep cervical intercostal lumbar arteries all these mainly supply okay lumbar arteries or lumbo sacral arteries sacral arteries intercostal arteries ascending cervical deep cervical so all these gives out radicular branches which reinforce this anterior and posterior spinal arteries one of the radicular artery is very large and it is called as the arteria radicularis magna okay so anterior radicularis magna or otherwise called as the artery of adam quick artery of adam quick or arteria radicularis magna which is the very large radicular branch or artery uh, which takes part almost the lower one third of the spinal cord it supplies okay so if this branch is actually uh, thrombosed or uh, 
what happens if the artery is blocked then naturally the lower part of the spinal cord uh, might suffer severe blood loss okay ischemia the it might undergo ischemia so veins you have longitudinal channels uh, six longitudinal channels so again one which is present uh, in the median so they are called as the median longitudinal channels one in the anterior median and fissure and posterior median sulcus then you have two antero lateral channels posterior to this anterior nerve roots and then you have two postero lateral channels posterior to the posterior nerve roots so 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 so totally you have six longitudinal channels so these channels form a plexus which is called as the venous vasa corona same way the arteries also form an arteria vaso corona because the anterior median Uh, in the anterior median fissure we saw the anterior spinal artery they enter through the sulcus as sulcal branches and they anastomose that forming a arteria vasa corona so here they form a plexus which is called as the venous vasa corona and then they drain into the radicular veins and from there through this internal vertebral venous plexus so from there internal vertebral venous plexus they might communicate with the Uh, basilar plexus of veins above okay which is in the basilar part of occipital bone and then from these they might also drain into the they drain into the systemic veins so azygos or vena cava system of veins in the thorax it may drain into the azygos system of veins okay lower part it may drain into vena cava system of uh, veins so thereby this uh, vertebral venous plexus has communications with your channel so that is why Uh, these have also have communication with other intervertebral venous plexus with the paravertebral veins through which it communicates with the prostate so that is why cancers of the prostate can actually spread to your spinal cord and brain mainly because of this uh, intricate or vast communication of the internal vertebral venous plexus which is seen within the vertebral canal same way you also have one more plexus which is the external vertebral venous plexus is also present okay so that is about the blood supply and the venous drainage what is anterior spinal artery syndrome so if the anterior spinal artery if there is a ischemia loss of blood supply because of occlusion of this anterior spinal artery okay or rupture of the anterior spinal artery then you can see this part of the spinal cord is actually affected so thrombosis of anterior spinal artery so lesion of cortico spinal tract and anterior spinal thalamic tract so what will be the symptoms so cortico spinal tract so naturally you will have a paralysis symptoms include paralysis below the level of lesion what happens is there might be paralysis you won't be able to move the uh, muscles okay it might be based on the level of lesion more higher level it might be also uh, total one half of the body hemiplegia or sometimes both the limbs it is called as the paraplegia okay so it is upper motor neuron type of paralysis so i will come to the upper motor type of neuron paralysis after some time what is it okay then loss of pain and temperature sensations because of the spinal thalamic tract is affected okay and then you have touch and proprio sensation is not affected because the posterior part of the spinal cord is intact so this is mainly to the fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus okay so the touch sensations and the uh, proprioception is again the spinal cerebellar tract posterior spinal cerebellar tract these are not affected posterior part so mostly the sensations even the pain and temperature because it is crossing to the opposite side so you have a crossed lateral spinal thalamic tract okay so this is mainly due to the anterior spinal artery syndrome so coming to the internal structure of the spinal cord a section a transverse or a cross section at any level so the spinal cord appears like this with inner gray matter and outer white matter okay 
so the inner gray matter you are able to see and the outer white matter the inner gray matter is uh, roughly h shaped or butterfly shaped which has a posterior horn which is somewhat slender or narrow compared to the anterior horn which is broader so you have a posterior horn and then the anterior horn in the thoracic segments of the spinal cord you also have a small lateral horn also in the thoracic segments of the spinal cord okay that is called as the lateral horn we see only in the thoracic segments okay up to upper lumbar l1 l3 at most okay then you are able to see both the horns are connected in the midline by the central gray commissure okay so the central gray commissure both the horns are actually connected and what happens is that central gray commissure is actually traversed by the central canal so the csf actually flows into this central canal below it will be actually continuous with the spinal cistern and above it will be continuous with the central canal of the medulla oblongata okay so that is the central gray commissure which is traversed by the central canal so this is your posterior horn and this is your anterior horn which can be also be called as the uh, ventral horn and the dorsal horn and in the thoracic segments you see a an additional lateral horn now coming to the white matter outer white matter what you see it is divided into columns anterior white column posterior white column and lateral white column so anterior white column is from the anterior median fissure and up to the emergence of the anterior root so this is called as the anterior white column again from the posterior median sulcus to the posterior emergence of the posterior nerve root so that is your posterior white column then this part between the emergence of the two roots this part in between is actually called as the lateral white column so you have anterior white column lateral white column and then you have the posterior white column now here also you can see medially between these two horns the ventral horns there is again a, a part of white matter which is also called as the ventral white commissure ventral white commissure okay so what is actually present in this white column is the ascending and descending tracks the axons are actually running ascending tracks all carry sensory information to your brain descending tracks mainly carry motor fibers motor information from the brain okay and then they relay into the appropriate segments of the spinal cord so with respect to the section anywhere if you take a section it has got a outer uh, white matter and inner gray matter but uh, their disposition slightly varies with the various levels so if you look at the cervical level the shape is somewhat oval in shape we are able to see that and large and you see the extensive white matter and also the gray matter okay with respect to the thoracic segments it is small and round and both the horns dorsal and ventral horn are actually slender mostly it is slender then lumbar again if you see it is slightly larger and both the horns are somewhat broad the ventral horn and the dorsal horn are broad then you come to the sacral again it is somewhat round and small and you see the white matter is almost reduced to a thin rib so this has the very minimal white matter okay so very easy to remember this is oval and large again oval and large alternatively these two thoracic and sacral are actually round and small so sacral you are able to see very thin uh, rim of white matter because the white matter has been distributed throughout the length from upper part and uh, it is only minimal here so sacral part is very large because all the white matter which it has collected from the lower part ascending tracks and the descending tracks yet to be distributed to these lower parts so you have abundant white matter you are able to see that okay so that is the difference so still more if you see again between c5 level so you are able to see the abundant white matter and small lateral horns you are able to see the thoracic part and very slender uh, 
uh, horns in the thoracic segments. In the lumbar segments, it is small and round. See here, it is oval. So, uh, in the lumbar segments, which you are able to see, is also oval somewhat, but both the horns are broad. And in the sacral segments, you are able to see the white matter is almost reduced to a thin rim. Okay. So, these are the uh, variations in the distribution of white matter and the gray matter with respect to the various segments of the spinal cord. Okay, now we will see a little bit uh, details about the gray matter of the spinal cord. So, you all know that it is possessing two horns. One is actually called as the posterior horn. Another one is actually called as the anterior or ventral horn. So, what type of neurons you come across mainly in the posterior horn? This is your dorsal root ganglia. So, the afferent uh, axon which is entering here will relay into this uh, dorsal root ganglia. And the central process which starts from here ends into the posterior horn. So, mainly the posterior horn consists of the central processes uh, relaying into the neurons. Okay, relaying into the neurons. So, the neurons of the central process will be present in the posterior horn. Apart from that, you are able to see some more neurons which are called as the interneurons which you will be able to see near the base of the posterior horn. So, this neuron we call it as pseudo unipolar. Now, the term pseudo unipolar is uh, not used widely. It is only simply called as the unipolar. The central process relay into the neurons which are present here. So, these are all sensory neurons. Okay. So, this is actually called as the first order neuron. Then from here, the axons from here will travel via the various white matter okay, as ascending tracts. So, the ascending tracts, they are ascending above to the brain and they will relay in the brain, forming the ascending tracts. Okay. Sometimes, you also have intersegmental tracts. So, intersegmental tracts, is, they end shortly and travel only up to two or three segments above or below. So, that means mainly the afferent information is actually distributed to one or two segments above or below. Okay. And then what happens is because of that, they might communicate with the ventral horn cells to bring about the desired effect. Because the desired effect, uh, the reflexes which we, we discussed in the initial part of this lecture, okay, the simple reflex not necessarily should be only at a particular segment. It might involve two to three segments. And that is possible by this intersegmental tracts, which run only between the segments. They don't uh, comprise the ascending tracts, which run all the way to the brain. Then interneurons, as I told you, which are interposed between these uh, dorsal and ventral horn cells. Okay. So, some axons of the higher segments, they terminate in these interneurons. Okay, and then they also convey impulses to the alpha and gamma motor neurons. So, interneurons are mainly a connecting link between the dorsal and ventral horn cells. Okay, so they when they are present in a reflex, it is called as the polysynaptic reflex. So, coming to the cells of the ventral horn, so they are all motor neurons which are of two types. One is actually the alpha motor neurons. So, they will go and innervate the muscle fibers, extrafusal muscle fibers. The other type of neurons, which are called as the gamma motor neurons, they actually will go and innervate your muscle spindle. Okay. So, alpha motor neuron innervate the extrafusal muscle fibers. Gamma motor neurons innervate your intrafusal muscle spindle. Okay. Then apart from that, um, in the anterior horn, you have the interneurons again, which we have seen. And then Renshaw cells, they are collaterals, so side branchings of the alpha motor neurons. These side branchings will again come and end in the alpha motor neuron only. So thereby, they modify or regulate the activity of the alpha motor neurons which are called as the Renshaw cells. So, these are the cells which we are able to see in the 
anterior and posterior horn that is the gray matter apart from that you also have a small lateral horn okay so lateral gray horn which is seen in the thoracic and upper lumbar segments mainly seen from l1 t1 to l3 segments so they are neurons of the sympathetic ganglia preganglionic neurons okay so the sympathetic ganglia receives uh, fibers from these neurons okay they are called as gray rami because they send information okay to this sympathetic ganglia they are called as the gray rami communicants they fall under the intermedio medial group of cells then same way in s2 s4 segments also you have some cells which form the preganglionic parasympathetic neurons okay they form the preganglionic parasympathetic neurons so the gray gray communicants will travel via the ventral route only not to the dorsal route and then through the spinal nerve it goes and supplies the area okay from the spinal ganglia what enters into the ventral route is called as the white ramai communicants they are called as post ganglionic neurons that will also be relate to the spinal cord okay so that is about the uh, pre ganglionic and post -gang pre ganglionic sympathetic and parasympathetic neurons now coming to the nuclei of the gray matter with respect to the nuclei of the gray matter nuclei of the ventral horn then you also have nuclei of the lateral horn and nuclei of the posterior horn so nuclei of the ventral horn they are present in three groups medial intermediate and lateral group so whatever the gray matter neurons they are aggregated collections of neurons which we call it as the nuclei in the ventral horn you have the medial intermediate and lateral group of neurons you are able to see that so medial group of neurons uh, mainly you are able to see supplies your trunk and neck muscles what are neurons of the trunk and neck muscles medial group of neurons in the ventral horn then you have the lateral group of neurons uh, which is again divided into ventrolateral dorsolateral and retrodorsolateral okay okay so you have ventrolateral dorsolateral and retrodorsolateral lateral group of neurons mainly to your limbs okay and uh, upper limb and lower limb so they are mainly seen in the cervical and lumbar enlargements so flexors are present posteriorly extensors are present anteriorly in these neurons so they comprise your ventrolateral dorsolateral and retrodorsolateral this is medial group this is lateral group this is intermediate or sometimes called as the central group there mainly two nucleus you come across one three of course only two we know the function one is the in the intermediate group it is called as the phrenic nucleus c3 to c5 which innervates your diaphragm the nerve phrenic nerve the phrenic nucleus okay then you have the accessory nucleus okay accessory nucleus you are able to see that is the accessory nucleus in between which uh, is responsible for the spinal part of accessory nerve which is going to supply your sternomastoid and the trapezius muscle so the nucleus for these is present in the intermediate group phrenic nucleus and accessory nucleus okay then when you look at the one more nucleus in the ventral horn itself the lumbosacral nucleus in the intermediate group in l2 l3 this uh, function which we are not still aware of it then nuclei in the lateral group is the lateral or intermediate column mainly it consists of inferior intermedio lateral group between t1 to l2 as i told you this is preganglionic to the sympathetic chain sympathetic ganglia which forms your thoraco lumbar outflow sympathetic then you also have intermedio medial group this is intermedio lateral and intermedio medial group mainly seen only in the s2 s4 segments they are preganglionic parasympathetic fibers okay they form the sacral part of cranio sacral outflow so these nerve will enter via the ventral nerve roots axons and then they will supply as pelvis planchnic nerves whereas branches from the sympathetic ganglia they are called as the uh, 
this splanchnic nerves greater lesser and least splanchnic nerves so mainly the intermediate group are preganglionic neurons of the sympathetic and parasympathetic now coming to the nuclei of the posterior horn so mainly you see a marginal nucleus dorso marginal nucleus the posterior gray column dorso marginal nucleus and then immediately deep to it what you see is the substantia gelatinosa both are actually concerned with the pain and temperature sensation so the axons of the pain and temperature sensations the central process of the dorsal root ganglia no? the axons carrying the pain and temperature sensations will be received by this nucleus okay dorso marginal nucleus and substantia gelatinosa this substantia gelatinosa is also continuous with the nucleus of the spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve then still more deeper to it you see the nucleus proprius so they are concerned mainly with the ventral spinothalamic tract okay uh, lateral is the cross to the opposite side this is ventral again see spinothalamic tract uh, you have the ventral and lateral lateral is for pain and temperature whereas ventral is for crude touch and pressure sensation so that will come and relay here then you have nucleus dorsalis or clark's column so which receives the posterior spino cerebellar tract mainly for proprioception muscle sensations so that will actually come and relay in the nucleus dorsalis or clark's column so these are the nucleus which you are able to see here okay and then you also have the visceral afferent nucleus pain sensations from the viscera okay this uh, again can be divided into laminar pattern you have 1 to 9 laminar pattern from posterior to anterior and lamina 10 is around the central canal so that part i am not actually going into those details mm, for the undergraduate level that is not much necessary so coming to the tracts of the spinal cord i am just giving the names of the tracts here because that is more of physiology and here you are able to see one side all the descending tracts are labeled and other side all the ascending tracts are labeled so descending tracts mainly you have the crossed corticospinal tract pyramidal tract it is called as and the uncrossed ventral corticospinal tract so this is one of the major motor tracts all the remaining tracts you see you are rubrospinal uh, vestibulospinal olivospinal tectospinal all these uh, red color ones are the descending tracts they form the extra pyramidal system apart from the corticospinal tract lateral and anterior the remaining your reticulospinal rubrospinal vestibulospinal tectospinal form the extra pyramidal system they are concerned with the coordination of the muscle activity and muscle tone maintenance of tone and smooth coordination of the movement whereas producing the movement itself is concerned with the lateral and the anterior corticospinal tract so that is why when these anterior corticospinal or lateral corticospinal tract is uh, injured there is a lesion it brings about total paralysis then ascending tracts you are able to see the spinothalamic tracts anterior and lateral spinothalamic for pain temperature crude touch and pressure sensations then dorsal spinocerebellar and ventral spinocerebellar for proprio sensations proprioception fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus for two point tactile discrimination vibratory sense and joint sense these sensations are by the fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus okay so that is a brief account of the tracts of the spinal cord so these ascending tracts usually so the neurons from the central process of the dorsal root ganglia forms the first order the second order neurons start from here and relay in the thalamus thalamus is a sensory relay center that is the second order neurons third order neuron starts from the thalamus and project to the cerebral cortex so you have three order neurons for this uh, ascending tracks whereas descending tracks you have upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons so upper motor neurons they start mainly from the uh, cerebral cortex and relay in the spinal cord or in the nuclei 
along the brain stem they are the cranial nerve nuclei second order neurons which are called as lower motor neurons start from the spinal cord and travel as the peripheral nerves or as the cranial nerves okay so coming to the clinical aspects what is upper motor neuron lesion so from the cortex what happens the axons might end anywhere in the spinal cord or in the cranial nerve nuclei if these neurons are actually damaged anywhere it is called as the upper motor neuron lesion so symptoms mainly include spastic paralysis okay and mainly it might be monoplegia paraplegia or hemiplegia one limb or parallel both the limbs or one half of the body so it is spastic so the muscle undergoes spasm rigid it is called as spastic paralysis and then you have exaggerated tendon reflexes whereas in lower motor neurons so lower motor from the spinal cord from the ventral horn cells where it travels via the spinal nerves if this nerve is damaged it is called as lower motor neuron paralysis which is characterized by opposite of spastic you have flaccid paralysis and not involvement of the whole limb or two limbs particular group of muscle or muscle groups will be involved and tendon reflexes are absent there is no exaggerated tendon reflexes flaccid paralysis and only involvement of the particular muscle or muscle group next coming to the syndromes mainly you are cauda equina syndrome okay first conus medullaris most commonly because of prolapsed disc or compression or any tumor of this region it is called as conus medullaris the sacral segments of the spinal cord are compressed or damaged or injured which might result in both upper motor and lower motor neuron type of paralysis you will see below the level of these the from the uh, at the level of the injury you can see lower motor neuron below that you can see upper motor neuron type of paralysis cauda conus medullaris syndrome and it is bilateral on either side you can see the effect okay and early onset of uh, urinary and bowel incontinence okay so not able to hold the feces urinary incontinence and uh, overfilling so you also have that and what happens is the anesthesia is around the perianal region loss of sensations over the perianal region whereas the less severe form is the cauda equina syndrome the spinal cord is not involved but the cauda equina the nerve filaments are actually involved so naturally you will have lower motor neuron type of paralysis but the anesthesia is saddle shaped so along the perineum from anterior to posterior it is saddle shaped and mostly it is unilateral not bilateral and urinary incontinence and fecal incontinence sets in only late not early here the effects are immediate here it is late or gradual onset then other defects of the spinal cord you come across complete transection so the spinal cord is completely cut at that level so naturally the effects will be upper motor neuron type of paralysis with the total paraplegia quadriplegia if it is at a higher level cervical level sometimes even uh, uh, breathing is affected leading to death okay so total loss of all sensations because all the sensory tracts are affected and all the motor tracts are affected sensations below the level of lesion so loss of bladder and bowel control this is actually will be there at any level from higher level up to the lower level if there is a complete transection the next is hemi section only one half of the spinal cord is affected that is called as the brown sequat syndrome so one half of the spinal cord is alone damaged it is called as the brown sequat syndrome which is characterized by ipsilateral same side corticospinal not the opposite side corticospinal tract is involved ipsilateral loss of joint and vibratory sense because of this one okay uh, your posterior fasciculus cuneatus and the one side lateral and anterior spino cerebellar tract and spino thalamic tract that contralateral loss of pain instead of ipsilateral it is contralateral because the crossed fibers are actually there so that is why you have ipsilateral motor paralysis 
and joint sense vibratory sense is lost but contralateral pain and temperature opposite side you won't have pain and temperature sensations that is called as the hemi section of the spinal cord then other diseases affecting the spinal cord is tibis dorsalis in syphilis so your posterior column is affected then syringomyelia along the central canal what happens is there is a wide cavity which is uh, affecting your central gray commissure syringomyelia then poliomyelitis uh, the which affects your myelination mainly your motor horn cells your ventral horn cells poliomyelitis of course we have eradicated this through vaccine and syphilis also uh, can be actually treated through drugs so apart from the damage to the spinal cord might be due to when the spine is not fused the lamina is not fused we have a bifid spine or meningocele so protrusion of meninges protrusion of meninges along with the neural substance is called as meningomyelocele okay so all these are congenital anomalies you also have injury to the spinal cord due to herniation of the disc fractures of the vertebra also so thank you very much we will meet again with one more topic